Thank you. And thanks for everyone who showed up this early on uh, Sunday. I'm amazed we got this many of you. Um, so first of all, apologies for rescheduling from, from yesterday. Uh, we, we were originally going to demonstrate um, computer-controlled swarming today, and that did not work out on this timeline. So we had to basically redo the presentation. Uh, we are going to be flying drones, and in fact, you all can fly drones with us uh, if you if you install the application known as Free Flight Mini. Uh, so we'll we'll do that at the end of the talk. Um, the talk will be about uh, 30 to, to 40 minutes. We'll introduce the project. Uh, we'll show uh, some clips of what we've done elsewhere, what others have done elsewhere. And uh, then at the end, we can do Q&A, and, and we can fly some drones. And also, just as some of you perhaps already yesterday uh, f flew some drones, we will be around all day today in the Congress. Uh, to give uh, flying lessons to anybody who wants to fly drones. We have about 18 drones with us uh, at the Congress, and uh, 15 are flight worthy. We've broken a few uh, props and, and things. Um, and we'll be flying them all day outside of La Fabrica and also next to the co-working space. So I am, I am Arto Bendigan, and this is my colleague. My name Dan is Dan Kumoni. And uh, we are presenting our project, Consensus Reality. Uh, we are a team of six people, five of whom are here today. Oops, looks like we lost the input signal. I um, guess we should uh, connect things up a bit better. Uh, okay. yeah. In the meantime, guys, please make sure that all the lights, all the drones are turned off, otherwise uh, the battery will go very quickly out, and we want to have that nice, nice crowdsourced swarm takeoff that we want to make up, make up with for you. All right, so consensus reality or short just con reality is a um, game platform that we're developing. Uh, so it's a, it's a um, software and hardware platform for making games. Uh, but these games are not like most games you know. These, these are games in the real world. Uh, so one of the one of the things that um, I, I personally, my family noticed, and uh, I'm sure many of you who have children, or perhaps nephews, nieces, or, or perhaps yourself, have noticed, is that um, a lot of people are being drawn into uh, virtual worlds, into pocket universes. Hundreds of millions of us are choosing to not participate in reality. Um, are choosing to, to um, play video games and escape reality. And it's easy to see why. As, as Frank said in his talk yesterday, reality is boring. Reality is broken. And uh, the statistics are quite staggering. In, in the US alone, um, about 3 billion hours of uh, productivity for better term are being lost every week to escapist fantasy. So these are hours spent in virtual worlds instead of the real world. Uh, now, of course, it's, it's not exactly uh, a loss from an individual point of view. Uh, after all, these individuals prefer the virtual world to the real world, so they presumably find some happiness and joy in, in these games. But from a societal point of view, it's, uh, it's quite a staggering amount of hours lost. And um, there's a great book about this called Reality is Broken, about five years ago by Jane McGonigal. Um, I highly recommend it to anybody who might be interested in this issue. Um, oops. Let's see, now we have some issue here. Uh, Okay, so one of the things we'll talk about today is the dichotomy between VR and AR. Uh, you are, of course, all familiar with, with these terms, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, on the left side, you see Johnny Mnemonic, the cyberpunk vision from 20 years ago. It's an iconic silver screen feature of 
um, ideas that were, um, uh, I'm sure, are familiar to many of you. Um, virtual reality, though, exactly represents the culmination of video games, the perfection of video games, the escape from reality, the escape from, well, um, what matters, you might say. Um, we, we are hugely, as a project, we are hugely interested and invested in augmented reality. And um, this is a developing area, um, but both VR and AR basically arrived this year. This year you have uh, headsets available commercially, headsets you can buy for Christmas that are at sub-1000 uh, price points uh, for top-end uh, 2000-3000. And uh, the vision from 20 years ago is finally, finally here for virtual reality. So this means that the, the problem we have with video games sucking you away from, from reality is only about to get worse. Therefore, that's the main reason why we're focusing on the right side with the well, nice billionaire and the helmet wizard. AR, uh, the main difference between VR and AR is that VR uh, closes you inwards and AR helps you interact with all the people around you in a much more interesting manner. It adds the digital layer to the reality. Therefore, we say, fuck we are. Millions of, millions of people are spending their daily lives. I'm, by the way, you might have seen much, many more pictures like these floating around the web with all the dystopian cyberpunk visions, people being drawn into, into universes, into the pocket universes, and basically shutting themselves, themselves in from, from their tribe and from, from all the, that makes us human, the social contact, the... Back slide, probably. Yeah. Uh, so, this has even been proposed as an explanation for the Fermi paradox. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Fermi paradox is familiar to many of you, but to recap briefly, um, it's the question of, uh, given everything we know about the cosmos, uh, the staggering number of stars on staggering number of galaxies, the question is, where the fuck are they? And this, this question is, is uh, a long-standing one, a difficult one. It's got many proposed answers. Here's one that stuck with me from a decade ago, that perhaps, just perhaps, it might be the case that uh, eventually, advanced civilizations withdraw from reality. And hence, there's nothing for us to detect. They'll presumably burn out with the star, or maybe they survive that. So, we, we are not huge fans of VR, um, but we do draw inspiration from cyberpunk culture. And an uh, important part of cyberpunk culture are cyberpunk games. Oops. This seems to have some issues. Okay. So, cyberpunk, again, uh, there's considerable overlap between cyberpunk, cypherpunk, um, uh, crypto anarchism, so familiar, but if not, there's um, a definition here. Uh, basically, the evil corporate state and lots of rain. Uh, this is William Gibson, this is Neil Stevenson, this is Akira, this is Ghost in the Shell, uh, this is Blade Runner. And an important part of that um, culture are the games. Well, we draw heavy inspiration from um, titles you might be familiar with. Are there any gamers in the house? Any particular? Nice one. Well, all the criminals with no girlfriends, right? Uh, do you guys know any of these titles? These are basically the staples of the cyberpunk genre in, in our generation. And uh, uh, but this is this is just the, the last iteration of the, uh, to the at this point hundreds of years uh, the the question that man has man has asked uh, was infatuated with man versus machine. The first occurrence was uh, when it basically started was on the onset of industrial revolution in the 18th century, where the uh, machine known as mechanical Turk was developed. Are you familiar with the concept, mechanical Turk, Wolfgang von Gemplen? And 
And it wasn't even machine at the time. It was it was just, it was basically fake. It was basically fake fake machine with the, the guy operating the chess moves underneath. So the underlying the underlying incentive to have battles with machines were taking place before they actually could take place. Next slide. And this is this is a nice screenshot from from the third game. It's the latest installment of Deus Ex. It just came out two months ago. And funny enough, this is actually Pra 2029. And I, I, guess. I, I, I assume it's uh, what's happening in the picture that's probably someone, the po nice police officer is uh, asking for papers in front of Paralani police. There's, there's toilets for normal people and for augmented people. Uh, well, they look more nice, so I guess that's just the part which devolves from reality. And uh, th this is this is a screenshot, the actual screenshot from the game, and uh, part of the visual that we are trying to achieve, namely the uh, battle and physical space, where where with humans on one side and robots or the machines and evil AIs on the on the other. Yeah, I think Terminator, I think Judgment Day, these are the kind of games we want to enable. Uh, and of course, it's not just man machine; it's also man machine versus man machine. But uh, this is what we would like to do in the real world. And that brings us to live action games, which is what we're all about. Um, let's see, there's a, there's a few categories of live action games that you guys may know. There's uh, Paintball, Airsoft, Laser Tag that we are mostly interested in. Recently, of course, you all heard about Pokemon Go and, and uh, you may have played Ingress. Um, here's something interesting. This is an Airsoft game. This is not an actual military operation, it's an airsoft game. Any of you guys have been to an uh, airsoft on paintball guy before? Yeah, so... Okay. Uh, did it look something like this? <laughs> this, is, this is actually a very, very high level uh, airsoft game. And uh, as you can see, there are people with uh, money to blow. And uh, well, basically decided, if you can afford a fucking tank in the, with the, in the battle with plastic pellets, why not go with the arms as well? Yeah, the solution to anything, to make anything more interesting, just add drones. By the way, that's a real life picture. No Photoshop was harmed during making of this. <laughs> uh, so this is something like what we want to do. Um, so we, we are at a very early stage. We're playing with uh, toy drones the size of nothing. But this is sort of where we, we are heading. And uh, we, we have a few brief clips uh, to show what has been done by um, done in this space today. As you can see, as you can see in the in the video, uh, already some someone came up with a crazy idea to load a hexacopter with a paintball gun. If any any of you were into the paintball game, have you been ever shot with a paintball pellet? You know how it hurts. We basically have the idea. Well, how about a machine gun? How about a machine gun? Machine gunning you from from 30 feet. Well, you have nothing nowhere to run. And he doesn't care. He will. He will. Even he will shut your fucking car. There. There he goes. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, a drone like this is only a few thousand euros. It's, these are not hugely expensive things. But thankfully, don't be afraid yet. The, the uprising of the machines is still, still far away because they do this. Yet. There's a few technical issues to work out <laughs> before Skynet takes over. And um, so that, that gives a flavor of, uh, of things we are aiming for. Um, perhaps just for comic relief, we can show the next level, which I believe some of you have probably okay. Se okay. seen before. This is the most famous fake US Russian. A YouTube with personality with uh, many interesting things. So 
so you can see these are not uh, these are not plastic pellets. This is basically you get the idea. This is basically taking the things to um, extreme we don't want to go. I mean, we don't want to. Uh, we don't have that kind of budget either. Not, not to belabor the point. And uh, so, one of the things that uh, we mentioned in the beginning is augmented reality. We're really all about it. This is the year it's arrived. You can buy uh, the Hololens from Microsoft for three thousand. That's the high-end gear. You may have seen some of the awesome videos. If you played Pokemon Go, you probably played it through um, smartphone interface. It's, that was an extremely primitive form of AR. And here's this is the next level. Here's the next level played with the Microsoft HoloLens. The graphics still suck, doesn't it? But so augmented reality games are just beginning to emerge. Let's skip this one. I think we're a bit short on time on this segment. Uh, you may have seen at, uh, at TED, uh, TED Talks this year, um, a company called Meta Presenting. Um, I think we're going to skip the AI segment just to, to save on time a little bit, but uh, you'll, you can easily find, find this video. It's quite, quite interesting, demonstrates where AR is right now. And uh, where the, the headsets you can, you can buy for, for not too much. <coughs> Uh, so, when we talk about augmented reality, and, and actually the very name consensus reality, consensus reality is a, is a pun on a number of levels. I'm not going to explain all of that, but uh, one way to, to think about the world once you have something like, let's say, Google Glass as, you, as your wearable, something you wear every day, is that you can think of uh, reality as overlays. There's physical reality. Physical reality is a bitch. You, you kick a rock, it re kicks you back. You jump off a bridge, you drop like a rock. Uh, there's social reality. Now, people, people at this conference are perhaps less um, affected by social reality than, let's say, the human baseline. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, we all are. Um, we, we, live, we live in an in a imaginary reality uh, with tied by um, social norms, social conventions. Uh, this is um, something that most people can't see past. Uh, I think many people here have seen past the matrix. Uh, now, consensus reality might be considered, once you have something like augmented reality, might be considered the, the common human knowledge base. Um, something like, if you imagine you have Google Maps. A few years back, you could pull up a Wikipedia overlay on it. I don't know why they removed it. It was quite useful. So that would tell you historic landmarks near you and so on. That would be an example of, you know, Wikipedia is not perfect, but it's what we have. And that would be an example of uh, consensus knowledge. Um, encyclopedic knowledge about the world that we kind of agree on. And then, of course, you can have your own individual universe, your own personal reality, your own personal private overlay pulled on top so I can see, for instance, that reputation score floating above Frank's head. And uh, this tells me that I trust this person completely. Uh, and I can see my past transaction history with, with others. And maybe I don't, uh, they're not all green. Uh, so these are the, the levels of reality that you can um, start utilizing once you have augmented reality. And we are particularly interested in this uh, middle one. You can, you, can, you can layer this cake many ways. It's, it's not a definite uh, final picture. Um, so, to, to get to what consensus reality is, is about, it's um, tactical software. So, we have, uh, for some time now, the last couple of decades, open source has taken over the world. We have everything open source now. You have even, even the boring things, uh, such as accounting software, ERP, point of sale systems. Everything is open source. Whatever you want is open source. But there's one big gap. Uh, if, you, if you were to draw out a map of the open source universe versus all software that exists, there's one big gap, and uh, I would call that tactical software. So tactical software uh, would be things that will, in fact, enable the kind of uh, 
games that we are interested in, but also you might uh, consider that it's software that the state has and we don't. Uh, so there might be things like um, um, there isn't an open source targeting system out there. I, I think there should be. Um, right now you can, you can get any number of physics or game engines, but you have to choose between ridiculous tuned uh, game mechanics or you have to choose within extremely accurate molecular simulation, uh, you have nothing in between. And that's one of the things we're aiming to change, to have a uh, physics engine that's capable of uh, being utilized in the real world for real world games that we care about. So this is, this is actually the, the point of, of Conreality. It's not really about drones, it's not really about any particular hardware. It's about, it's about enabling capabilities, tactical capabilities in the real world. And this is what we are working towards. So for instance, uh, I once upon a time I studied physics to learn about terminal ballistics. It took a while to get to terminal ballistics, but never mind. Um, and uh, that is what enables the creation of uh, something that will put, um, put a pellet on target in a, in a game such as the ones we're creating. And uh, just to demonstrate briefly how much tactical software makes a difference, uh, what we've seen, it's an uh, open source uh, rifle. This is not your grandfather's rifle. It has a li li Linux proprietary targeting system. It's, it's made by uh, Tracking Point, a company in Texas. And as you can see, Bing, five, uh, 12 year olds. It makes, it makes um, pretty decent snipers out of 12 year olds. So here, when you, when you press the trigger, it doesn't actually fire, it just locks onto a target. And then the rifle will automatically fire when it is certain it will hit the target. Or reasonably certain, there's never certainty. And uh, these are the kind of things I, I think uh, would be nice to see as open source. For one thing, they enable very interesting games. I think that, that probably demonstrates the point. And so then to, to, to close up, um, the project is um, not unprecedented. There are at least these three existing robotics frameworks. So a lot of this is about robotics. Drones are a subset of robotics. And uh, these three um, frameworks are further along than we are, but they, they sort of they don't have any particular point to them. They, they seek to be all things to all people. We are specifically interested in enabling MILSIM military simulation games in the real world, augmented reality games. And that means that um, uh, we, are, we are almost the, the first in this category. There is only basically this example that we know of. As you can see, uh there, there's already people working on something similar, what we want to achieve. This is actually a championship sponsored by DJI, which is one of the most, one of the biggest uh, drone manufacturers from China. And uh, they, they, they have, there has been, this is, this is shot uh, roughly one or two months ago. So this is all fairly new and uh, all rapidly evolving. And as you can see, the, uh, well, the Chinese basically jumped on the opportunity and uh, already s started going going further in this in, in, in the system. Oops. So that that would be an example of uh, a kids game that you could do with uh, something like our system in a, perhaps a half a year's time. Um, we are currently working on, so here we have uh, commercial drones. These are available actually quite cheaply. I recommend these as Christmas gifts. Uh, let's get everybody into drones. So these things cost about 90 bucks, 90 euros. Um, you can buy them from Amazon, you can buy them anywhere. We have some other things we can demonstrate in a bit. But we are beginning to build our own drones. We are beginning to build our own concepts and this is because of the easy accessibility to, to 3D printing, uh, to um, 
computer-aided design enabled, for instance, by online services such as Vectory. So we are beginning to, to put together our own uh, concept vehicles. Uh, we have with us um, we have with us that we can we can show you guys uh, afterwards. We have a laser to red concept. We have our first scout car, scout car Mark One, and we have a couple of uh, assault drones um, of different kinds. We have uh, this is all um, very very much wires sticking out at this point, but. Uh, and, and actually, we burned one of the engines just the other day, accidentally, so this one won't fly just now. But we have a couple of, uh, couple of bigger ones um, that we can let you guys fly outside. Uh, the, the point is to get, a, get away from, from these uh, toys, although there are nice uh, uh, demo prop. Um, this is our team. Uh, five of us are here. Uh, Gogulski couldn't attend. You, many of you probably know Gogulski. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what we do. Um, we are based in Berlin and Bratislava. Uh, in Bratislava we do hackathons about once a month, maybe once every couple of months. Uh, sometimes they turn into drinkathons, but uh, it's another matter. That's our patron saint, Charlie, uh, Mike's cat. And uh, the next hackathon will take place in October. Uh, we haven't set the date yet, but in case any of you might be interested, uh, please talk to us. Um, all, the only thing I'm going to mention about technology is this. Uh, this stuff is, this stuff requires a, a broad and deep, uh, much broader and much deeper um, set of skills than your average software development project. This is quite challenging. If you guys happen to know what most of these terms mean, I want to talk to you. Uh, you would probably make a good contributor to the project and you would probably immensely enjoy the work. Uh, so what we what we are looking for here is uh, people who see the potential, see the potential, and uh, they want to work on something tangible, something that isn't just abstract software running inside some computer screen or server or from another continent. Something that you can actually touch, uh, something that makes a makes a difference, and actually hugely challenging compared to almost any project you could tackle. And it's hugely fun. Um, so come talk to us. We'll be around for the rest of the day, a little bit of tomorrow. And uh, if you want to contribute, we definitely want to talk to you. And so let's get, to, let's get to the flying of the drones, which I imagine most of you uh, heard this was about. OK, guys, uh, everyone who's managed so far to connect to the drone, Raise your hand so we have at least some. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Okay, so roughly seven. Okay, so uh, we'll try to do a countdown and. Uh, okay, so let's try to get uh, give him, uh, get them in the air one by one. Okay, next. Uh, yeah. Uh, next. Drone so pilot number three is like him. Uh, next. Yeah, so this, as far as we know, this is the first crowdsourced uh, uh, next. flying of drones. <laughs> uh, you can still participate by yeah. just the instant. Uh, next. Do we have any more drones left? Uh, next. Come on. <laughs> Try to bring them up. <laughs> and turn, turn on the lights. Light them up. Yeah, the light switch is in the middle of the app. And now just take the last pictures. No. Any more drones? Yeah. Any more drone pilots? Yeah. Oh, the batteries are probably dead. Uh, ah. okay. It can take it, don't worry. You can, you can do better, Kill. Take some questions in a in a couple of minutes, but let's let's let people uh, have their fun if they are if they have the means. Uh, you can still participate by installing from the Play Store. So this is Android, tablet, or phone. 
the app Free Flight Mini. Free Flight Mini. And that will let you take control of one of these drones via Bluetooth. And it's quite easy to fly. Uh, kids, we, yesterday we had kids as young as uh, three and a half years old who managed this, so I'm sure you can too. Yeah, let's, let's give them a couple of minutes to fly. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the battery life is anyway only like seven minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, so and juice it up. Yeah, and uh, and then let's uh, let's take some questions, and uh, then we can move outside to let people fly outside. Mm -hmm. Right. I uh, would like to start with some questions. Should I ask you for the first? Uh, well, you could ask us. You you actually asked me a good question earlier. You asked me whether it's open source. So uh, if you if you just uh, repeat that, I can maybe elaborate briefly that it's actually public domain. Okay. We want to make it totally available for everyone. Okay. And by the way, these drones are quite uh, safe. These small ones. So if you have if you have children, this these small ones won't cut off their fingers or anything like that. Don't worry about it. The, the range on this, uh, these are known as Parrot Mini Drones, and it's a French company making them. Uh, the range is about 20 meters with uh, Bluetooth, and that's how your phone is controlling them. We also have uh, some more interesting models, which we can demonstrate outside. Might be a bit constrained to fly here. Unless you can manage. Yeah. Uh, this drone over here is the Parrot uh, Swing. Uh, you could also call it the X-Wing. So this is a hybrid uh, quadcopter and plane. It's a vertical takeoff capability, uh, and it can transition into plane mode, at which point it goes very fast indeed. <laughs> well, I think we lost the prop on that one. Thankfully, we have some spares. Uh, it, all it takes is a lot of super glue and extra propellers, and these things are generally quite unbreakable. Maybe a little duct tape once in a while. Yeah. So this, um, we, we're, fan, we're big fans of this um, uh, X-Wing drone. It just came out two weeks ago. Looks like we have some uh, collaborative chaos going on here. Anarchy in action. Yeah, maybe let's let's um, we're running short on time, so we could move on to the Q and A session. Q &A. You you guys can uh, can fly this outside in uh, just uh, ten minutes' time. Okay, so uh, first, thank you for your presentation. Uh, that was very interesting, very futuristic for me. Uh, I actually heard the first question. Uh, is it open sourced? I heard is it open sourced and where I can find the source code? Uh, yes, this is uh, totally open source and not only open source, it's public domain. We do not place any copyright restrictions. We have a 100% copyright free code base. Uh, anybody can use this for any purpose and we don't mind. Okay, thank you. So, uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. No one, okay. Uh, I have um, maybe another question. Uh, where do you accept to uh, start to sell your product to customers? Uh, well, we, we don't actually plan to sell anything. This is an, uh, an open source project. Uh, I'm sure there are tons of commercialization opportunities, spin-off opportunities, but at least for myself, I don't want to get sidetracked on that. We, we, we're doing this as, a, as an open source project. Um, we won't necessarily have any products as such. We'll have designs people can download, people can make. Maybe um, we'll get somebody like Seed Studio in China to, to manufacture this and people can buy them directly. But it's, it's not really about the profit angle. Okay, thanks. So, anyone? 
Uh, yeah, given given the similarities to military technology, do you see any? Uh, do you have any um, fears of abuse, and do you have an idea how to prevent that? Uh, well, this would be one of those questions that I'd be really tempted to answer. Uh, flippant, it's not my department, but um, um, I think for this audience, it suffices to say that technology is uh, value-free, and uh, you can. Use it for good, and you can use it for evil. We intend to use it for games. Okay. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask the same question, so I will just add a note. Uh, I think that uh, right now the states have a monopoly for power. They already have these technologies, and they are probably much more advanced than what you guys uh, have right now. But uh, as you develop it, uh, you will take the power from them and it will be uh, more available. And as you said, uh, it can be used for good and evil. Uh, but it gives people the power to uh, maybe defend them themselves with the technology. Uh, yeah, I'll take that more as a comment than a question. It's yeah, yeah, yeah I said it was just a comment. Uh, I wanted to ask if it's principally possible to uh, let these drones fly, uh, fly autonomously uh, by a computer because I think these little toy drones don't have all the sensors you would probably need to do this. Uh, correct. Uh, so for instance, this parrot means they, uh, they don't have a usable camera, so you can't, uh, you can't really do anything like computer vision. Um, the, the drones we're building ourselves, they have a, a computer vision and we do slam to map the environment with uh, LiDAR or, or with uh, uh, monocular uh, vision. And uh, so, so these this, um, parrots are necessarily limited. Um, they're just toys, but you can, you can of course make them, you can still control them via the computer, you just need to control them via Bluetooth. Now we didn't, for technical reasons, actually manage to get that working reliably for, for, for today, but uh, it's quite possible in principle. Um, for, for the larger drones, we actually control them via Wi-Fi. So that's just sending uh, UDP, UDP packets around. It's quite easy. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, if it's not, so... Over here. Over here. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry. Is your software developed from scratch or based on something else? Uh, it's, it's mostly from scratch, um, as in our code base is, um, as I said, totally copyright free, so we don't copy any code into it. Uh -oh. uh, and also we need to learn all of the fundamental technologies ourselves as we go along, so that's one reason to, to sort of do it. But there's one huge piece of functionality we are importing, and that's the autopilot. Uh, there's a project called Ardu Pilot, which is a fantastic open source.